Our, our normal uh, IT people are not here either, as you can tell. Okay, so let's uh, get started. And uh, I will start by stating the theorem I plan to talk about, which is the following. Uh, let Q in zero one and let CQ GLS be the C star algebra of a quantum plague manifold. So I'll tell you what all this uh, means during the talk. Um, but the theorem is that then there exists a directed graph P uh, such that our Easter algebra of our quantum flag manifold is isomorphic to the graph Easter algebra. Okay, so this is uh, the theorem we want to show. So let me tell you a bit about all the components involved. So we have a bit of a mixed audience. So I will recall what a uh, graph Seastra algebra is. So by a directed graph, uh, E, I mean a four tuple. So E, E zero, E one, R and S where E0 uh, is a countable set that we call the vertices. E1 is another countable set of the edges. And these R and S, these are two maps that take us from the edges uh, into the vertices, and they are called the range and source map. So why is this a graph? Well, if we have some edge E in our edge set, uh, then R and S correspond to the range and source of this edge. So we give the edge a direction. So if R of S is V and, sorry, R of E is V and S of E is W, then we get an edge between V and W and the source will be W. So for those of you uh, who might be uh, interested in directed graphs and their Schuster algebras, I should warn you that if you look in any papers done by the Australians or New Zealanders, because of the uh, Coriolis effect, all of the things go backwards. So uh, you have to switch the range and the source there. Hopefully this will not confuse me along the way. Okay, so uh, to every such directed graph, we can have a graph Schuster algebra. So graph C star algebra uh, denoted C star E of a directed graph. is the universal C-star algebra given by some generators and relations. So for each edge, uh, sorry, for each vertex, we get a projection and all of the projections for different vertices should be orthogonal to each other. So pairwise orthogonal projections
These are indexed by our edge sets. So uh, for the non cesar algebraists in the crowd, a projection means that it squares to itself and it's also self-adjoint. And uh, partial isometries, with pairwise orthogonal ranges. And these will be indexed by this would be a zero, our edges. Sorry. So partial isometry means that uh, S star S and S S star are both projections. And when I say that their uh, ranges are pairwise orthogonal, I mean that uh, this projection, uh, this corresponding, this is the range projection. So the range uh, of these guys are orthogonal. All right. And we have some more relations. What's that? First of all, uh, whenever we look at the range of an edge, the partial isometry according to an edge, it's going to be the same as the projection of the uh, range of the edge. And if we have a vertex and we want to know what this projection looks like, well, it's going to be the sum of all of the source projection, where E is, source of E is equal to V. But this actually only makes sense if uh, V doesn't have infinitely many edges coming out. So So this is just saying that, uh, yeah, V does not have infinitely many edges coming out. And this means that V uh, is not what we call an infinite emitter. And since my talk will actually contain infinite emitters, this is uh, something good to know. And then finally, we can still say something about those vertices that do have uh, infinite emitters. And that is that, uh, um, how did I write this? So this should always be a sub projection of its source vertex. We can write that like this. So this is the same as saying that uh, just in terms of Seaster algebras that this, this is actually uh, smaller than this as positive elements. S E S E star. Ah, yes, of course, thank you. Okay, so if we happen to have a Seaster algebra, um, A, and we know that it's isomorphic to some graph Seaster algebra. Why, why is this a nice thing? Well, Turns out that uh, many of the Seaster algebraic properties of A, we can actually just read off of the graph itself. Hmm. 
not the greatest chalk, I apologize. So some examples, we can tell if, if A is unital. So this will be only if there are finitely many vertices, for example. We can tell if A is uh, purely infinite or stably finite. Uh, we can tell what whether it's simple, and more generally, we can even say something about its entire ideal structure. And we can also say things like, uh, so a graph Feaster algebra always comes with something called a gauge action, which won't necessarily be used in this talk, so don't worry about it, but we can detect things like gauge invariant ideals as well. Uh, so we can read off the K-theory directly from the graph, which is also very nice. And also very nice is that uh, these admit a complete classification, at least in the unital case. I think it might be all, but let's just say unital, unital graph these algebras at least classifiable by their K, well, by K theory plus a little bit extra uh, with no assumptions of simplicity. So this is quite in contrast to a lot of other classes of Seastra algebras where you definitely need simplicity or something not so far from simplicity. So it's very useful if you can find uh, a graph C star algebra model for your given C star algebra. Uh, so it's more than just K theory uh, because you need to take into account the K theory of the ideals and the, the spectrum, etc. cetera. So, uh, I mean, Okay, this is maybe classifiable in quotation marks because nobody wants to have to figure out all these K-theory groups, I would guess, even though in principle, it's definitely doable because of the graph. But yeah, yeah, you need to match up all the ideals. And at one point they were calling it a K-web. I think that is probably <laughs> an appropriate term. Oh. Also, can I ask, so in the this dichotomy, pure infinite stably finite, so in the simple case, it's actually AF, the stably finite ones you get, is that right? Uh, yes. But maybe not in the non-simple case. Do you know? Like, can you get non-AF? Oh, no, 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 actually. Yeah, oh. in the non-simple case, you can get non-AF. You can okay, get yeah. uh, my first example. Okay, okay, great. Which is AT. <laughs> great. So examples, uh, many of our favorite Seaster algebras uh, can be described as graph Seaster algebras. So for example, we can take a very simple graph uh, where there's just a single vertex and a single edge. And then we look at our uh, graph properties and we see that we have that SE star SE is gonna be the range of this edge, which is PV, uh, but it's also the source of this edge. So we get this. And then uh, using number three up there, we see that uh, PV acts as, as a unit uh, for every, guy in the generating set. So in particular, it gives us a unit for our C star algebra. So what does this mean? Well, we have something, a universal C star algebra generated by a unitary. So we get C of T. So yes, non-simple, not necessarily AF. Uh, another nice example. Uh, so V, now let's call this E1, E2, and EN. Now we can check again these relations. So all of them still satisfy that EJ star S EJ is PV. Uh, we also get from three again that PV is going to be our unit. Uh, but now we have uh, used this relation two here and we see that this is equal to the sum J equals one to N S E S E star. 
So what do we get here? Kuntz algebra on, yes. Yeah. Okay, and you can even do this with infinitely many uh, edges. Same picture, you get O infinity. Uh, here's another. Ah. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. All mistakes I hereby blame on having to run around finding the key for this place. Okay, so uh, here's another nice one. So B1, B2, B3, uh, up to the N, B1, B2. And this gives us MN. So to see that, uh, the trick is to map EJ to E, J, J plus one, I think that should work. So where there's a one in J, uh, in the J, J plus one entry and zeros elsewhere. Of course, we generate the matrices, so there we go. Uh, we can, again, have infinitely, uh, the infinite version of this, and that gives us the compact operators. Same, same trick. Um, other slightly more interesting things is we can get uh, the templates algebra. So that's the templates algebra. So the templates algebra is the universal Caesar algebra generated by a proper uh, one sided shift. Okay. So another one with infinite many edges, which will probably crop up later is this guy. So this double edge means there's infinitely many edges between these two vertices. And this gives us uh, the uh, unitization of the complex numbers. Okay, so those are some nice examples that uh, if you get bored, I mean, just try to figure out why those uh, isomorphisms exist. They're kind of fun uh, to figure out. And there are also, however, some more uh, interesting examples connected to quantum spaces. So this was originally the first example. Such examples are due to uh, Hong and Shemansky. In fact, a lot of these examples are due to them. So for example, the P star algebra of the quantum two n minus one sphere. looks like this, so, well, let me just draw you maybe S5 here. This, this is, gives us S5, uh, and we can also, they also did quantum complex projective space. So here's CP, uh, this should be CP2, I guess. Looks like this. And other things, including quantum lens spaces. Quantum teardrops. Which definitely should be the name of a sci-fi romance novel. Uh, quantum teardrops, 
uh, our very own Sophie did the quantum symplectic sphere. And uh, some more. Okay, so what exactly do I mean here when I say quantum space? Those double arrows in the CPN, the in, in, in the infinite. Okay, right. Yeah. Yeah, infinitely many. So in particular, uh, uh, CP1 is just this, which we saw over there. And this is the published here. Come back. Yep. Yeah, pretty weird. Okay, so uh, yeah, so what I mean by quantum space, I suppose uh, it's a bit vague what people usually mean, but uh, usually this is referring to some sort of Q deformation. So what, what does that mean? Well, you take, you take some uh, function algebra on a space, a classical space, uh, that's a commutative algebra, commutative Feaster algebra if you complete it, and if you have one that's given by generators and relations, then what you can do is throw away some of the commutation relations and replace them with relations involving the generators and uh, functions in Q. So that's kind of vague, but uh, here is an example of where that, oh, and I, sorry, I guess the key point is also that uh, when your Q goes to one, you should get back uh, functions on that space. So here, here's an example. Uh, we have, uh, due to Varnovich, we have quantum SU2, which is also quantum S3. And this is generated by two elements. Uh, subject to the relations So I should say, uh, let Q in zero one. Q doesn't necessarily have to be uh, in zero one, but it will be always in, in this talk. Okay, subject relation alpha, <coughs> now let me get this right, minus Q gamma star, uh, gamma alpha star. This is unitary. So if you put back Q equals to one, then it's not difficult to check that you just get uh, continuous functions on S3. Or, well, this doesn't even have to be a, a feature algebra. It, it, this also works just algebraically. So that's sort of a proto typical example, and we will actually come back to that later. Now, give me a second, because my pages are slightly out of order. Page four. Where are you? Uh -huh. Oops. Okay, uh, but in the cases we're interesting and in, we're interested in, you can actually do this in a very nice way. So, um, by nice I mean you get back 
you, you retain a lot of the properties that you have in the classical case. Okay, so um, basically, whenever you have a compact, connected, simply connected Lie group, such as uh, SU2, uh, you can Q to form them in a very nice way where, as I said, they retain very nice properties. So, for example, from our quantum S3 or even quantum S odd dimensional sphere, this will admit. Uh, action of S1, and you get as six points quantum CPN, or in this case, CP1, um, which is very nice. That is just as you expect from the classical situation. And uh, CPN, this is an example of what is called the quantum flag manifold. So it's part of a larger class of quantum flag manifolds. Maybe I'll just write that down. Uh, and this again is just as in the classical case. So we can put quantum just here in bracket, projective space. So flag manifolds classically are, let me get this right, Ray can correct me if I'm wrong. They are simply connected compact homogeneous Taylor manifolds. Is that right? <laughs> and yeah, so yeah, hom homogeneous with respect to us, I mean, the belief uh, group. So in particular, they arise as quotients of uh, quotient of simply connected compact semi simple Lie group. Just as we saw CPN. Or uh, this is this is a quotient of S U N to N here arise. S T. Yep. So actually, there's there's. There's quite a few, uh, there's a whole se bunch of different series of these guys, uh, which I will write down in a moment. Um, <laughs> so the nice thing about simply connected compact semi simple groups is that they always emit a very nice 
formal way of two deforming them. And this retains a lot of the least theoretic information that you want. And there's really a, a sort of a recipe for doing this. Uh, so we do this uh, by associating a Q deformed uh, enveloping algebra of the corresponding algebra. So basically, the enveloping algebra, for those who don't really know of a Lie algebra, is somehow you take your Lie loosely speaking bracket and then make it actual commutators and it turns into an actual nice associative algebra and these are much more i guess tractable than working with the lee algebras themselves or often are i suppose um so take yourself a lee algebra do i need adjectives for my lee algebra here uh, compact semi simple Lie algebra, complex semi simple. And you can associate to this, as I said, the so called enveloping algebra. The least theorists will know what this is, but you can also take yourself a Q of zero, 1 and associate. Q-deformed enveloping algebra. And UQ and UG share many traits. So for example, uh, UG here is, is always a Hopf algebra. So that means, for example, it has a co-product, co-unit, uh, uh, antipode. Uh, We'll need the co-products stuff later, but don't worry so much about that. Um, and this also admits a hop algebra structure. So you haven't deformed the hop algebra. I mean, you still have a hop algebra structure, which is nice. So UQ of G is a hop algebra. Um, it has the same number of generators. And it has the same finite dimensional representation theory. So it really is a nice least theoretic uh, object. So I don't really want to get too much into the construction of this, but there will be some aspects we like very loosely loose aspects we'll need. In particular, we need to know that it's generated by certain elements. So uh, if G has rank R, then uh, U cube G is generated by AJ, EJ, and FJ for J from one to R subject to a lot of relations. But the relations themselves are, are, are not arbitrary. So uh, you can essentially read them off the corresponding Dinkin diagram. So uh, Bichon was asking what uh, Lie algebras and Lie groups satisfy these adjectives I put on them. And the answer is you get one, uh, there's several different theories of them. And you can distinguish them via their Dinkin diagram. So let me draw the Dinkin diagrams because they will also be useful later. So we have A, N, it's going to be N many. Uh, nodes attached like this. Uh, BN looks similar. But now at the end, we have this double uh, directed line. CN is like BN. But now this directed guy goes the other direction. 
dn. Has the horns at the end. Uh, then there are these so called exceptionals, like E6, which looks like I'm going to draw the right number here. Uh, wait, is this E6? There are seven rows in E6. Is that true? No, there's six. Okay. Yeah, I can count. Good. Good job, Garen. <laughs> uh, E7 is the same, but has extra node E8 is the same, but has two extra nodes. And then we have F4, which has this double arrow in the middle, double line in the middle, and then a G2, which has three guides. So essentially you can get uh, the relations by looking at these diagrams. So there is a recipe to find them. Uh, the other nice thing that, that these uh, diagrams tell you is the vial group. So the vial group is the symmetry group of the root system, if you're familiar with that. Okay, so how, how did one do this? Maybe I can just stick it in the corner here if people can see. So you have a generator for each node. So generator SI for each node. And uh, SI, SJ mute if there's no line joining them. No edge joining them. Uh, SI squared is uh, the identity for every I. Uh, and then we have that S I S uh, J squared uh, is equal to one. Is it squared or cubed? Cubed. Yeah, I know. Uh, so this is if, uh, if I, J joined by one edge. And then this will be uh, uh, to the four if it's joined by two. Sorry, <laughs> this is really hard to read, but uh, six if it's joined by three. But okay, there's only one guy with three. So it doesn't matter that you can't see this. Uh, so this 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 uh, is the vial group associated to that particular uh, Lie algebra. Okay, so we have this quantum coordinate algebra that is maybe I'll leave that. Um, and dual to the quantum Q deformed enveloping algebra is the so-called coordinate algebra. So this is dual, uh, hop, theoretic dual, hop, dual of this guy. Uh, so The quantum coordinate algebra. And uh, here G uh, is Q. Well, let me say first that uh, this always admits C star completion. Which we denote by CQ of G. Now, this will no longer be a Hopf algebra because uh, the structure map won't extend. However, the co product uh, will extend. And what we get here is actually a compact quantum group, Alavronovich.
and this is important to know because we want to use uh, the co-products later on to construct representations. So in particular, we have this co-product. Okay, so what is this when Q goes to one? We get back, uh, uh, if Q is one, then we get the one of G is just gonna be continuous functions on G where G is the adjectives simply connected. Semi simple compact compact Lie group whose Lie algebra is the G we started with. So these are very nice uh, examples of two deformations, quantum spaces that fit into this idea that you have. Some, when Q goes to one, you get back to some commutative thing on a classical space. Okay, now using this, we can construct a Dinkin diagram. Uh, from the Dinkin diagram, we can construct flag manifolds, which is what we are after. So how do we do this? Take your favorite Dinkin diagram and choose a subset of the nodes. Better uh, hurry up. I'm not sure what time we actually started, but I feel like I'm running out of time. Okay, so uh, choose a subset S. Of nodes on the corresponding Dinkin diagram. Then we put L, uh, LS, that's math frac L. Uh, this should be the subalgebra of UQ, G generated by uh, all the Ks. But now we don't throw in all the F's and J's, uh, F's and E's rather, but just uh, corresponding to those J's uh, for which uh, are we, that are in our subset of nodes. So this is a subalgebra. We look at the dual picture. We get a surjection onto uh, the coordinate algebra. Oh, sorry, I'm doing this the other way around. Uh, wait. Did I do this properly? Wrong way. Come on, hand. Work with the brain. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, from this, we build the coaction of OQLS on OQG, and then we define OQGLS uh, to be uh, the covariant subalgebra with respect to this action.
And just as you would expect, when Q is one, you get back the coordinate algebra of the classical flag manifolds. So throw away all your Qs and this is actually a flag manifold as well. You don't know the, that definition. Uh, now, what do I want to erase? All right, so here we can complete these guys to a C star algebra. This is the C star algebra of our quantum flag manifold. Quantum CPN is an example. We know this has a graph C star algebra model. So we ask ourselves, do these have graph C star algebra model? Well, we already know the answer because I stuck the theorem on at the beginning, but um, uh, the four of us got together in Edinburgh with the idea that we would just look at what Hong and Chomansky did and try to generalize it. But we immediately ran into some problems because even though I'm telling you that there are ways of uh, figuring out what the generators and relations of these spaces are, it's really hard and they get very messy very quickly. So they're somehow much easier for CPN than for any of the other quantum flag manifolds. So for example, for quantum CPN, most of your commutation relations just get sort of, they're just skewed by a Q. But in, in, in these guys, you get things that are completely not like, a bunch of different things adding up and cues all over the place. And that's if you can calculate them in the first place, which is a bit of a nightmare. I tried to do it for the quantum Grassmannian 4-2, which is probably the, I guess, the easiest non-CPN example. And I managed to, but it was a bit of a nightmare and I definitely didn't want to do it for anything else. So since Hong and Shemansky had sort of really looked at the generators and relations of the spaces and then the generators and relations of the graph C algebras and sort of uh, stuck them together to get their isomorphism, we just couldn't really do this. But it turns out that we know more about these C-star algebras than just that we can write down generated relations. What we know is their irreducible star representation. Um, yeah, I guess, so I keep going? I guess, probably. All right, so we know what their star representations look like. Uh, okay, thanks. And this turns out to be the key, the key uh, way at getting at these graphs, these graphs. But. So what do they look like? Okay, so take your, say an here and we cross off some nodes or fill them in or whatever you like i don't know and then s corresponds to the uncrossed nodes okay cross nodes on db and then s corresponds to uncrossed nodes So for example, uh, if I take AN and just cross the first guy, that, gives, that will give us the CPN. Now, we always have a map from uh, UQ SL2 into UQ G. Uh, for each uh, uncrossed node. And what does this do? Well, UQSL2 is going to be just generated by EK and, and F. So you just say, okay, we uh, take the J node that's in S, and we're going to map this, these guys to K, J. EJ, FJ, respectively. 
So that means that we get uh, a map from CQ uh, G to CQ SU2, which I will call rho. Just flipping everything around. And from this, we can write down uh, irreducible representation. So I will cross off some of these guys, at least some of them I'll cover now. So for each node in S, we can define star, star representation of CQ uh, GLS, which we call pi S, well, let's say SI. And this will be a uh, 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 I want to call this because it depends on I or J, I guess I'm calling it J, sigma J. So we map into CQSU2, and then we compose with uh, this map rho, where rho, so this goes from CQ uh, G to uh, C L two Z plus, where rho is the representation that uh, Boronovich wrote down for C Q S U two, which is defined on the generators, which I think I left up still alpha and gamma, uh, by sending alpha. So if E n, this is just the usual orthonormal basis of uh, L two Z squared, then where does this map? I will always forget exactly the uh, things. Okay, then this is square root one minus Q, the two N, E N minus one. So it just shifts things and it maps gamma. This just multiplies by Q to the minus N. So that means for each node, we get a uh, representation. And of course we can restrict this uh, down to our, our flag manifold. It's a subalgebra. And then for every element in our vial group, so remember the vial group was uh, basically uh, by abusive notation, I'll denote the generators of the vial group also by SI. Then you can write SI, uh, sorry, you can write any element in the vial group as uh, some. word in the generators. So you can always do this uh, in a reduced way. So the length is uh, small, the smallest possible length. And this doesn't depend on uh, your choice here of generators. And then we define pi w uh, to be pi, what did I call this? S, yeah, good. S i1 tensor pi s i. Okay, now this is where we need to use our, our co-product. Okay, so this takes, uh, well, at the moment, it just takes something in CQG into uh, some L2 Z plus direct sum Z plus direct sum Z plus. Um, so this gives us a representation of CQG. The co-product. S-I-K? Ah, thank you. Yeah, that makes more sense. Thank you. Uh, oh, well, I guess I will erase this. Word. Okay, so this gives us uh, irreducible representations. And in fact, we get 
all the irreducible star representations of our quantum flag manifold, but we get duplicates. So we, we don't want that. So how can we uh, avoid that? Well, take uh, WS to be the subgroup of the wild group generated by uh, the SI corresponding to nodes in our big set S. So in this case, uncrossed nodes. And then take WS to be minimal length coset representative of then this is Dykhausen Stockman. Uh, irreducible uh, star representations are indexed by the set WS. And as I mentioned, uh, or maybe didn't, but okay. You, you can, there's more than one way to write W uh, as a bunch of generators, but as long as this is in reduced form, then it gives you the same star representation. So it doesn't depend on your choice of reduced word. It's pi W does not depend on choice of reduced words for W. The upshot here is that there are uh, finitely many elements in the primitive ID space of CQGLS. And that means we can use a very nice result uh, due to Eilers, Sorensen, and Ruiz, which tells us when a C star algebra with finitely many primitive ideals is uh, isomorphic to a graph C star algebra. So I'm kind of running low on time. So let me maybe just write this in sort of maybe way, but so this is Eilers, for instance, Lewis. Uh, if A has finitely many primitive ideals, and uh, every simple subquotient is isomorphic to either the compact operators or C, Then there exists a graph E such that A is isomorphic to E. And in fact, uh, I should say an amplified graph, which just means that whenever you have uh, an edge between two vertices, you have to have infinitely many edges. Uh, right. So basically showing that there is some graph just boils down to showing that these simple subquotients are always going to be the compact operators for the complex numbers. And we can do that using some more information on these irreducible ideals, uh, sorry, irreducible representations. Okay, so that's kind of done, but really want you want to see some graphs. So, so it's more than just an existence result, okay? So they actually have, uh, uh, 
So moreover, let's say, I think we need A to be simple, uh, unital. If A is unital, uh, then, then this isomorphism is uh, if and only if they have homeomorphic tempered primitive ideal space. But actually this tempered thing we can kind of ignore because this is actually sort of a special case of their result. So it's really just saying that the primitive ideal spaces are homomorphic. So now all we have to do is write down graphs that give us the right primitive ideal space. And it turns out that we can do this quite easily and you do it uh, again by just looking at the vial group, which you read off the Dickin diagram. So for example, uh, we can immediately get back. Well, actually that's not true. We don't quite get back. Okay, well, let me say the formula first, the recipe. These draw drugs. Oh, uh, homeomorphic. So yeah, you need to include the uh, topology, Pell kernel, whatever it's called. Uh, okay, so um, let's say, okay, take W, in your ws well v and w and we say that v is less than w if there exists some mu uh, such that uh, w is equal to uv and uh, the length of w is longer than the length of v then how you draw the graph you look at your elements in WS and you connect them exactly when, so uh, E zero is just gonna be uh, indexed by elements in WS. And we put an edge between uh, two of these guys exactly when uh, inf infinitely many edges put infinitely many edges from, I just want these to see vertices actually, W, W uh, to V, if uh, W is less than V and uh, V equals S I W to some generator S I. Okay, so uh, definitely probably gone over. Um, anyway, uh, huh? Oh, okay. Well, let me just say quickly. So, so it, it's pretty easy to uh, take uh, CPN, cross that node. Everybody else is there. So, what do our coset representatives look like for CPN? Uh, well, uh, the only guy that's, we get the identity, we get uh, S1, we get S2, S1, S3, S2, S1. We can't get S2, S2, S1 because S2, S2 is identity and we already have S1 in there. We can't get S1, S2, S1 either because then we can apply uh, the relations that I've erased and, and we get a two on this side. And that's uh, then going to be the same coset as this guy, uh, blah, 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 up to where, I, so this is CP3, let's say. Okay, so we see exactly what we do. We get infinitely many edges, which does not quite look exactly like the graph I have now erased of CPN for Hong and Shemansky, but actually it turns out that they are uh, the same by some of these crazy graph moves that you probably heard people talk about before. So there are certain moves you can do on graphs that give you isomorphic C-star algebras. And indeed, uh, this gives us the same C-star algebra that we got for CPN by Hong and Shemansky. Apparently the difference is they will have a, they're not isomorphic 
uh, as these are all rules of gauge action. So we don't know what role this gauge action plays. Anyway, uh, you can also get some other weird guys, like if we have, uh, let's say, again, if we're just looking at uh, the A series and we cross all our, all our nodes here, then we get the full flag. And do I remember what on earth this looks? Oh, wait, wait. So then you crossed all the nodes. WS is going to be the whole wild group, uh, which is S3, I guess. So how does S3 go? I ID S1, S2, S1, S1, S2, S, uh, is that it? I guess. Or am I missing? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, S. Right. Is that it? No, there should be one more. S1, S, S2, S1, S2, S1. Huh? Oh. Uh, S2, right. Okay, wait. S2, S1, S2, S1. S2, S1, S2, S1. If I put an S1, do I get something different now? Uh, no. I don't think so. Is this enough? One, two, three, four, five, six. But isn't it one, two, three, four, five? This guy is no there? Not there? Ah, yes, of course. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so 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 this one's a bit more of an interesting graph because then we know that we have uh something that looks like uh so the identity is shorter than both S1 and S2. And then we have something that looks like this. Okay, so uh, you can do this with any of these thinking diagrams. Uh, and this is nice because we uncover certain isomorphisms that we didn't necessarily know existed. So first of all, you can immediately see again that uh, these can't depend on Q. There's no Q showing up in these pictures. So the C for algebras don't see Q. Um, I've erased it now, but CN, remember it was like this, but then two guys going arrow the other way. So the arrow doesn't matter for the vial group. So they have the same vial group, VN and CN. So if you cross the same nodes on both, you get the same C for algebra. It's also perhaps slightly surprising. And in fact, uh, yeah, if you were to cross this node, Again, I think you would get something that's isomorphic to some CQ, CPN. And you can figure out what all the ideals of these guys look like, uh, which means you can tell, for example, that uh, this guy will uh, map onto, uh, so a, a quotient of this will be CP3, for example, because you can see CP3 in the diagram. So that's also quite a nice. Uh, thing. Anyway, I, I'll finish there with a million apologies for being flustered due to running around like a maniac earlier and for starting late, etc. Thank you for actually hanging around people on the internet. Yeah, that, that was that was amazing. Uh, thanks, Karen. It's very, very interesting. Um, I, this theorem I didn't actually know about this Isla Sorensen and yeah, yeah. Ruiz. It's kind of nuts. Yeah. yeah, like it's really powerful. Yeah. Like, what is the provenance of this? Like, where? How do they? How is this proved? Do we know? I gave this talk in yeah. Volsak and Soren was there, uh -huh. and he he was like really shocked that I was using this theorem because for him it was just some like mini step along the way to proving his bigger isomorphism of all graphs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, these algebras, or sorry. Uh, classification of all graphs and structures. But then, yeah, it seems like this is the only time that you can say that if it looks like a graph, it is a graph, these are algebra. Yeah. And so, for example, we saw that Hong uh, and also Sophie could do sphere as graphs, these are But we can't apply this result anymore because uh, they won't have uh, finitely many primitive ideals. Basically, there's like some torus sitting in there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so they should also be graphic algebras, like they look like graphic algebras, but 
we can't use such a, a thing to just say like, well, if it looks like a graph piece algebra, it is a graph piece algebra. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I don't think they can hear you online, right? <laughs> also, I guess the, the, the uh, awkward silence might have had them. No. Uh, yeah, we can't hear you, Marco. I think if you unmute, we should be able to hear you. Oh, no, Marco's there, I think, now. Yeah, sorry, I can just barely hear you. If you want, I can go first, but I think that Brani was before me. Oh, uh, thank you. I haven't been able to hear anything Ray said. Uh, I looks, uh, just a quick question. Um, is there any obvious geometric representation theoretic significance in the pre-image of the Levitt path algebra? Or is no. it just like detritus? Like... Uh, I don't think so. Okay. I mean, so for example, in the Levitt path algebra, you would have uh, projections for every vertices and mm -hmm. there aren't gonna be, I mean, you would hope that maybe you get the coordinate algebra or something out of this. Yeah. Have projections yeah. in there. So I, I, nothing that I could think of maybe, but uh, yeah. Nothing obvious in mind. So, so these are really, uh, as it were, homeomorphisms and not anything more morally. Uh, sorry, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Marco, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, maybe I got a bit of a long comment. Uh, first of all, okay. Thanks for the talk, Karen. Uh, I wonder if you've seen this recent paper that I have with Bob Yanken. I have because seen it, but haven't read it very carefully. Essentially, we proved that, so we define certain objects like Q equals zero, and then we also do it for the case of the groups, and also this homogeneous space that we've been talking about. And we show that in general, you can describe them using higher rank graph algebras. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the point is that, let's say, for the example of SUN that you gave at the beginning, it seems to me that the natural object to describe as a graph sister algebra is the sphere, yep. right? Because there you have the natural gauge action. And somehow then the Podler sphere, let's say it appears simply as the gauge invariant part of that, uh, which somehow naturally is an AF algebra. And it seems to me maybe a little bit by accident can still be described as a graph sister algebra by putting infinitely many edges, if you see what I mean. I mean, in, in the sense that the gauge action here is not so important. Yeah, it yeah. completely yeah. disappears because it comes from the gauge action of the bundle. Yeah. And somehow you're disregarding that by putting infinitely many edges. And so kind of accidentally can still be described as a graph algebra. But in a sense, the natural object that can be described as a graph algebra is what lies above which let's say in your original example would be the sphere. I mean, certainly those should also be graphic algebras. I agree, yeah. Like yeah there's so in no fact, what we show is that in general, uh, you can define these bundles and they are higher rank graph sister algebras where the rank is simply the rank of the corresponding torus. Sure. Then you would obtain all these algebras that let's say we're talking about by just looking at the gauge invariant yeah. parts. Yeah. And there is something weird because in your case, it seems that only the vile group plays a role, but in general, there are more elements that do not come from the vile group. So it seems that one, once you take this gauge invariant part, a lot of the complication kind of disappears, which is Perhaps. interesting. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, when you look at the Hong and Shemansky example, I mean, for example, if you have any guy where you're just crossing a single node, uh, yeah. then there's only really one choice uh, for circle bundle. And I think there, basically, you just erase the infinite edges and put loops on everything. But what my guess for uh, other bundles, I don't know what they would look like. Maybe this is where some of that stuff comes in. Yeah, so first of all, if you cross more than one edge, uh, sorry, one more than one node, you have a higher dimensional torus, right? No. So, 
Uh, why not? I mean, I'm, I'm talking about crossing nodes. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm you... talking about this bundle. So well, when you take the gauge invariant part of that, you will get your graph algebra. Uh, but if you try to generalize what would be the sphere in your original example, yeah. uh, then you would have a larger dimensional torus. So it cannot be seen 